Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming. I'm always pleasantly surprised when uh, a large number of people turn up. You never know quite what to expect. It's also very pleasing to see a number of old friends that I haven't seen for some time. It's obvious what I'm going to talk about. Uh, many of you here must have been to theme parks in either England or Europe or America. And if you have, uh, you will have observed a, a sort of wide variety of, of things. They all have certain things in common. First of all, they have no function except to amuse you or to scare you. Uh, secondly, they're um, passenger-carrying devices. And I suppose thirdly, they're all a very complicated in, or strong interaction of several engineering disciplines. There's obviously structural engineering, but the need to understand the other disciplines of mechanical, electrical, and control engineering are quite significant. And it's that close integration that sometimes causes some problems. And um, the variety is enormous. Uh, they vary from very simple things to very complex structures. And the big rides cost several million pounds a piece. So if you look at a, a fairly simple ride like a, a roundabout, it's not particularly complicated because just round, you sit on it, and it's for children. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is some covers from the structural engineer. And the three on the sort of left and of one is a big wheel in America, in Las Vegas, and designed by Arabs. And there's a roller coaster. And on the bottom left is the new ride at Brighton, the I-360 Tower. And you may have read a report about that. The one on the right isn't a ride, but it's a moving structure. And a moving structure has bearings, a control system, uh, a drive system, and electronics, and things like that. So you could say all moving structures are a subset of rides. The only thing, they don't give you a thrill when you jump on them. But the, the technical problems, the generic engineering problems, are the same. And the same sorts of disciplines are involved. And here's a sort of slightly uh, more detailed one. I'll talk about some of these later. Obviously, that's a big wheel. I'll talk about some wheels. The one on the top right is a roller coaster. And if you look at that, the blue and the red are two different tracks. for suspend One's a suspended coaster, one's you sit in. And part of the thrill, of course, is you might think, or the intention is that you'll think you're going to hit the one that's coming towards you because they're going opposite directions, so you're going to bob. If you just think for a moment and look at that steel structure, uh, the complexities of just fabricating it and getting it in the right shape are quite formidable, and the technology for that exists quite a bit. The bottom left is... Uh, a dinosaur, a Tyrannosaurus, and the, the significance of that will appear later. The one on the right isn't exactly the same. Uh, it's just a simple walk, skywalk, somewhere in America, I think. And all you do is put on a harness, and if you stop your knees knocking, you can walk around the outside. And if you really want knees to knock, uh, you can try this, which is a... Uh, and I have to tell you that I've ordered a special ticket for our secretary here tonight to try out this in, uh, in, a, in a later format. But obviously you're sinking the crocodiles, and uh, hopefully you can r rise out of it again. And we'll talk a about that later as well. But there are huge varieties. And this next slide is perhaps one of the most important of the night. <coughs> All of us in engineering... Whatever we do, whatever type of structure we work on, or somebody has to stand up and answer the simple question, is this safe? Now, it's a very simple question, but it's a very complicated question to address. And if you look at some of the disasters that have taken place, like Notre Dame last night, Grenfell Tower, many of the other disasters that take place, this concept of safety and being able to articulate what makes something safe and to work across all the different disciplines to make sure something is safe and to demonstrate that it's safe is a skill that's required from the nuclear industry to the rides industry to everything we do. And it's not something that's widely understood or appreciated and it's not a skill widely shared, but it ought to be shared more than it is. So I'll say more about safety later. But just here, I will say, 
that rides actually are statistically extremely safe. You're more likely to be injured driving to a theme park than you are when you're there. But sometimes things go wrong. And at least the rides industry has a system of checking safety and a system of learning and feedback from when things go wrong. The information is openly shared. And that's a lesson that could be learned better in general structural engineering. <clears throat> I'll just give you a brief rundown of ride history. Obviously, entertainment's been something people have wanted ever since the Romans used to uh, have gladiator fights in the Colosseum. But we don't do that now, but it was sort of ritual fights sometimes. But here's a famous painting by Bruegel, a medieval fair. A lot of these things stem from that time. There were all sorts of rides and swings and roundabouts and whatever, whatever, just to entertain people. Leap forward quite a bit, the 19th century, early 19th century, and a lot of these rides stem from Russia. People started doing ice slides, entertainment in the big cities, uh, because obviously ice was fairly well available. Here's a picture from Paris in 1817 where somebody had invented a toboggan ride. You got on the top and came to the bottom, you know, fairly, obviously an early, an early form of roller coaster. Manchester, as usual, is the centre of everything. And uh, in this particular case, the passengers didn't go on the ride. Someone got on it and demonstrated it for you, but there was this when they got on and did a complete loop. And uh, you can even see there's a safety net at the bottom in case they didn't quite make it. I think the industry probably really took off in America in the late 19th century when there were all sorts of entrepreneurs making things up to entertain people. And an early ride was just a, a um, scenic railway. Somebody thought this was a wizzo idea. You got on a train and went through a series of nice countryside and came back again. And someone else then decided it would be a good idea to uh, sort of let this loose a bit and created the uh, runaway mine train, which is now a generic form of ride on a lot of theme parks. And then, of course, to end of the century, when the workers got paid holidays, there was mass industry, things like that. There was also a demand for mass entertainment. And places like Margate around here and Blackpool really were in their heyday. Mass number of mill workers used to go, all looking for entertainment of various kinds. You can see Blackpool Tower was built for no other purpose than to house a circus and a ballroom at the bottom and go up and take the view. There was a big wheel. And about this time, the Pleasure Beach started to develop on the right-hand side, and that's still going fairly strong today. And equally in America, Coney Island developed with its rides and things of that nature. And this is um, one of the oldest rides at Blackpool. There's a number there which have plaques on them for their historical nature. And it was the original wooden Big Dipper when you came out to the top, went around a circle and came, hopefully came all the way back again. And part of that's still there. And then in the 1950s, uh, the manufacturers really took off with a lot of imagination because they started using steel track. And steel track offers a number of advantages in giving you more flexibility on how you shape it, how close you can get the curves, how accurate you can make it. And it allows you as a designer to do a number of things you really can't do on a wooden coaster. So 1990 was one of the first suspended coasters. That's at Chessington here, where there's a track, steel track on the top, and you're suspended from it, come round. And this is the Pepsi Max at Blackpool in 1994, which Hanif claims to have worked on there, Mr. Cara, who uh, used to work with me or for me, whichever way you uh, interpret it. And I can remember, we, uh, our first job on this was to make the, the, the scaffold, the, the, the trestles, but the track wasn't particularly good. The track was imported from America. And we were asked if we could fix it. And we really didn't know much about it. But we thought we'd have a go. And we changed the geometry. And I remember I had to climb up over the top, all the way down the side, to check it. And when we changed the geometry, the owner said, well, you changed it, you ride it. So I, I had a, a, a go on that. I'll, I'll tell you. And uh, it was, it was, of course, it's quite scary to go over the top, but you sort of get used to it. Hanif claims to have done it as well, and, uh, and, and, and been, it wasn't with me, it was someone else. But then, of course, they got more and more sophisticated. Alton Towers uh, was, was uh, flourishing, 
and uh, this is a suspended looping coaster, the track, uh, twin track with a coaster on it. And people became more and more daring. And obviously the, the thing is to give more imagination, to try and do something different. Because nobody has to go on a ride. You have to persuade them to part the money. You have to persuade them with a bit of bravado or a bit of white knuckle stuff or that it's better than something else before. So it's got to be bigger, better and different. And this was really the first complete revolution that was made. Now it's only 2002 at Blackpool. And uh, that was another big leap forward. So there are even bigger and better ones now. So that's a sort of brief history of them. Obviously, there's a great variety of them. I'll just go through the, the principles of design. And design here is more than just the structural engineering. It's a concept. The designer has to talk to the owner about what he would like. And obviously, there are some rides suitable for children, and there are some rides suitable for daredevils who want to be uh, frightened and show sure they can live with it. So one of the things you sell is the sensation and thrill of going on a, on a coaster. This is quite an old picture, you know. You can see that uh, it wasn't particularly scary at that stage. Uh, you sell also the psychology of it. So as you go up that hill to take off, it takes a long time. And the principle is that during that long time, you are getting more and more scared because you're anticipating what's about to come. And when you get and look over the top and look down and wait till they dispatch you, you're supposed to feel, feel total fear because of what might happen thereafter. Of course, you know it's going to be all right in the end, but whatever. People thrill to acceleration. So the amount of acceleration you can give in the ride is under the designer's control. Something else you can do. You can take off, not literally, because there are undershot wheels as well, but you can feel as though you're taking off if you go over a vertical curve just as you drive quickly over a humpback bridge if fast enough. So that's another thing you can do, provide airtime. And then there's other themes you can build in. Just when you thought everything was over, the dinosaur's head will bob down to take a bite out of you, or the nail door will swing down, and obviously you're supposed to think you're about to hit it, and uh, you won't. So the track designer has a geometry, he has a space, he has the client's uh, land, and the client will tell him, these are the sort of sensations I would like to build into it, what can you provide? And really, the physics of it is dead simple. It's only A-level physics. It's only the standard equations of motion. You take something over the top of the hill, it's got some potential energy, you push it over the top, and that is converted to uh, velocity at any point. And the key parameter you need at any point in the track is the velocity. And the force is mass times acceleration, and if you go down around a bend, you've got a V squared over R effect. And that applies either in the vertical direction or the horizontal direction. And that V squared R gives you the acceleration and a different sensation of force. And you can control the radius, you can control the height, you can control the rate of drop and things like this. Now this really does work in motion, in, in reality. So I'll just show you a short clip here, now uh, just to show you that the physics actually work, you know, if, well it should work, just a minute. Now, this, this bit of lubrication there, tribology is another uh, technology you're supposed to know something about. And this, this comes with a standard warning of... Uh, uh, don't try this at home. Anyway. Uh, the, the, the physics are about right. So you can control the acceleration, you can control the radius, and you can control what people feel. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Yes, there we are. So those are the basic things you need to know. Not very complicated, really. And if you get the velocity right, you get the speed right, you can turn people upside down, and some people quite like that. Or the other thing you can do is roll them round in that direction. So you send them on a track that twists, you can roll them around as well. So in general, the designer has a portfolio of motions that he can impart to the ride, and it's, it's his imagination that uh, develops it. And what people feel is what's important to us, because the designer has to control what people feel. You can't, you know, we're not into the space rocket stuff where you can cope with 5G. You can take things instantly. So it has to be kept within certain parameters to prevent any damage to people, 
and so on and so forth. And there's a bit of subtlety on the track, just as on a road, on a horizontal curve or a vertical. If you don't go from a straight to a circular arc, because that suddenly makes the person jerk. And if you're rolling at the same time, your head gets thrown over. So you don't want to do that. You want to control the rate of turning to something that's, that's tolerable for a human being. So in general, we've got sensations of people work motion in three directions. That way, that way, that way. Three, 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 three axes and roll and twist as well. And you can vary any variations on a theme. There are a few number of complications. And one of them is the equations of motion relate to a particle of finite size. In fact, a, a tra train is not a finite size in relation to the track. So on a track like this, the speed of the coaster is going where the centre of mass is. But the front and the back end are going at the same speed, but the wrong speed for where they ought to be on the track. So that means that, uh, if I've got this right, on a coaster like this, this is like Water Valley in Yorkshire, the people at the top are going too slow for where they ought to be, and the people at the bottom are going too fast. So the sensation you feel at the three parts of the train are different, and you can't get the camber matched exactly to what it ought to be. So there's a, a set of forces that aren't quite right. One way around that is to design a coaster which is wide and thin, so it approximates more to a particle and matches more to the ideal of the physics that you would like. And you get a smooth ride about, uh, out of that. So, this is the track at Blackpool. You have a track which is a high point to set off from, which gives you the potential energy to start with. You push it over the top, it converts to kinetic energy. Any point on the track has got a velocity. That velocity gives you the acceleration as you're going around the radius, and you've got a set of motions that you impart on the paying public and they either appreciate it or never go in it again. You know, it's whatever they do. And people are always trying to think of something more ingenious. You know, anything that's different. Because the novelty wears off after the time, and for various reasons, these, these coasters don't last too long. You're always trying to do something different to attract people into the park. So here's a sort of vertical, curvy, twisty one. But the principles are exactly the same. And then what we have? We have linear, radial, angular velocity, and acceleration all varying with time, and preferably uniform. You don't want a jerky ride, because that throws a human body around. And the train length is an issue. Now, as an institution, we're always trying to encourage young people. I'm quite pleased to see there's a lot of young people in the audience tonight. And there's another clip here of um, young engineers who've got some practical skills and uh, put it uh, into sort of um, into practice. <laughs> Now, if there are any members from Crossrail or High Speed 2 here who would like to add an extra frisson to their... Uh, <laughs> would like to do that. They obviously work on the just-in-time principle as well. Isn't <laughs> so anyway, this is what the design has to do. You know, we control the motion. Well, part of it is psychology perception. You have, to, you have to believe certain things. They're not necessarily going to happen. Of course, when, 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 when the track's built, um, uh, one of the first tests is to send the car around with accelerometers in it and measure what actually happens in three directions to check that the design reality or the reality matches the design. So this is a check off one of the ones we worked on, which is a timber coaster in Norway, and that would uh, check what actually happens and to make sure it's about right. There is an element of uncertainty in it, obviously, because if the wind's blowing head on, the coast doesn't go as fast, a certain amount of friction you can't define, it depends if it's been raining or not, and things like this. So there are a various amounts of uncertainties in, the, uh, in what actually happened. Right, so 
in any track, you have to as, control the motion because of the degree of uncertainty, and that means there are certain braking facilities around the track. And there's various sorts of brakes you can use. There's conventional ones or there's magnetic brakes and things like that. And the uncertainty comes from these energy losses, which are not fully definable. And a track might look something like this. There's a ride starting point, and you can see brakes at various points, and there are sensors on the track which feed back to the control system which in effect says, this is how fast the roller coaster is going. If it's going too fast, you trim it a little bit to control the speed. You have to keep it going at a certain speed because you want to be sure it makes it all the way around the track. And there are problems sometimes, and part of the problem that you saw from the Smiler at Dalton Towers, because the wind was blowing significantly and one of the cars stopped. So, for instance, at Blackpool, the, the ride goes out to sea and the, it's the wind that governs whether it'll get all the way around the track. So there is an operating wind for any ride. People won't go on a gale, obviously, so there's an operating wind, and there's a maximum wind to make sure it doesn't fall down. But here, there are brakes around the track, and the control system checks how far the, fast the, the coaster is going. If it's going a bit fast, it trims it a little bit, and it makes sure it stops. And the brakes are something like that, the caliper set of brakes. Or magnetic brake is something like a linear motor. You know, it creates a magnetic current underneath it as it goes across. And if all else fails, uh, you, on a, you can dump it into water. So there are certain rides where water shoot where you end up and this huge amount of water goes up. And that's the thrill effect. In structural engineering terms, obviously there are a set of forces on the track and all these have to be brought down to the ground, back to Mother Earth. And the most obvious one is wind. So there's obviously a fairly big wind on these things. But we don't, you don't operate in a storm. So there's a sort of conventional number, about 20 metres a second or 15 metres a second. You can hardly stand up in 15 metres a second. So there's no point in trying to operate anything bigger than that. And there will be a case of the, track, the, the coaster on the track in 15 metres a second and the track on its own in a storm to make sure it doesn't fall down. But you don't mind if it waves around a bit. It doesn't really matter the deflection. But wind is an issue. And so is track expansion. The track will get hot, and it will expand quite significantly. Now, if the track is low down on the ground, that's a problem. But if it's up in the air and curved... If you work out the geometry, the curve just increases a bit. So generally speaking, there are no expansion joints. Expansion joints cause more trouble than they're worth. And the principle is to put it up in the air and just let it expand. And if you work out on a curved section, it just the radius just increases a bit. It doesn't really make a lot of difference. And everything just moves with it. So that's the way it's normally, uh, normally approached. And on a ride like this, obviously, the, the forces are fairly easy to work out. It just depends how fast it goes. That gives you a horizontal force, and you can work out all the or its structural forces fairly easily. On a roller coaster, what you have to try and do is look at the forces at any point on the track in time and bank or cant the track over with camber so that you try and make sure that the, the, the vertical force through the centre of people's body goes to the camera. That's what governs the camber of the track. So the geometry of the track then becomes quite complicated because it's varying in 3D, twisting, and the cant, certainly if it's a, a, a car on the top, has to be try and matched to what the forces are at any one point so that you don't get an overturning effect or something unusual on the people. Now, you can never get it exactly right. Certainly on the long train, it's wrong back and front. And that gives a different set of forces for any point on the track, depending on where they are. But that's the principle of what you try and do. And, of course, the geometry and th it comes quite challenging. So you, it's partly imagination, it's partly f suck it and see, it's partly trial and error, it's partly let's see this and see, it, see how it works out. Of course, the, on, a, on a coaster, a suspended coaster, the sort of self-correction, because the people will go at the right angle if they're articulated properly for wherever they are. Another significant effect for structures 
that is easily overlooked is fatigue. Now, most of you in this audience will never either have designed anything for fatigue or never have to design anything for fatigue in your life. And therein lies a danger, a danger that whenever we tackle something new, that it will be a hazard that you've never thought about and completely overlooked. But fatigue is a dominant issue on rides. And you can see that fairly simply. If you look at the two bits on the bottom, a bridge, and you think about the fatigue is impo imposing a stress range a lot of times on a structure. And the arithmetic is that life is inversely proportional to stress range cubed, or sometimes the fourth power at low stress. I'll come back to that in a minute. But if you look at a bridge, the dominant strength and stress of the bridge is to carry the dead load. And there are perturbations, fluctuations from a bit of traffic. So there is fatigue. Okay. But not the same as a coaster. On a coaster, the dead load, the track itself is zero. And the live and dead load are everything. And it's got multiple wheels coming over every second, every few minutes. So there's a very big stress range solely related to the coaster. But when you do the arithmetic, because the life is proportional to the stress range cued, it's obviously highly sensitive to what you assume the stress range is. And any of you will know that the real stresses in a structure are not exactly predictable. You know, you never know whether something's fixed or pinned. You know, it's not like that. So you, there's a degree of uncertainty in predicting the stress range, no matter how you do the calculations. And arithmetically, that uncertainty will manifest itself because of the cube effect in quite a significant variation on life. So the safety strategy has to be, one, you design for fatigue, and two, you identify where the weakest links are, you make sure they're inspectable, and you inspect them, and the design process has to be that a crack is detectable on starting, and it won't endanger the structure provided it doesn't progress too far in a time where it's ca catchable. And the other part about a, fatigue, a, 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 a theme park is, it's, certainly in the UK, it's normally closed for six months of the year, so you can patch them up. So, you, well, you can't really patch a bridge up. Well, you can, but it's not really, you'd have to stop it. So there is a different sort of philosophy. But fatigue is a very big issue, and it's not easily predictable. And for example, this two examples of fatigue failures. If you look at the one on the bottom right, this is a running rail, and there's a slight lip in the running rail. So as the wheel comes over, it thumps down. There's a dynamic effect on the following tube, and that tube tends to lozenge. And there's multiple wheels coming across every few minutes. And eventually, you get a fatigue crack starting if the track's too thin along the two sides. So you can see some of these here drill the hole in the end to start and hold it a bit, give you a bit of breathing space. And that one there, somebody forgot about it and uh, probably had a life of a few weeks. And if you can occur in the most amazing of places, so there's fatigue cracks in a seat. So my top tip number one, or top tip number two today, if you go on a coaster, just have a look behind you when you get on to make sure the seat's all right because it's possible to have it anywhere. It's just a fluctuation of stress. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can get cracks like this. Now, everybody should know that on a gusset plate on a tube, a standard problem, forget in fatigue, that you will come across is somebody will pick a tubular structure for its size and forget the impossibility of making the connections because the wall is too thin. That's the starting point in statics. The stress concentration at the end of the gusset is significant, which nobody will ever calculate in normal engineering. But stress fluctuation when you're revolving something results in a fatigue failure like that. And it's non-repairable. So it's a disaster. And that's an interface between 
of design where you might not appreciate it for the for the inexperienced who've not experienced it before. So just be careful. Sometimes it's very difficult to predict what happened. There's a suspended coaster, obviously highly engineered from a professional firm. And this will apply to railway structures as well. But as the coaster goes down the track, if there's the wrong interaction with the track imperfections, it will start to haunt down the track. So it will start to oscillate down the track. In this particular case, the front and the back seats then resonated with that oscillation and started swinging about. And the result was that there was a fatigue failure in a welded detail at the bottom and a seat fell off. So there are a number of design issues for the unwary where you, like, you can easily overlook it. And that's one reason why detection and inspection and designing to make sure you can find something before it progresses too far to be dangerous is a fundamental part of the overall design. It's not just the numbers and the stresses. It's part of the concept. And, of course, most people will not get much experience of fatigue. I'll say a few words about big wheels, because I've worked on a large number of them. This is the original one at Ferris Wheel, named, amazingly enough, after Mr. Ferris, at Chicago's World Fair in 1893. And a, a, a large number of those were built around the world, uh, quite popular. The one you saw on the Black Bull Pleasure Beach was one. This is the only one still standing, the one in Vienna. And it, uh, the cabins are not particularly elegant. They look like a bunch of old railway wagons, which is what they actually are. But it's a uh, historical structure that goes round. And this was the London Eye successor, which is now uh, 20 years old and is still taking 4 million visitors a year. I was down there yesterday and you couldn't move along the front because of the people piling in. So that's uh, been going 20 years. And there are people throughout the world that have been deciding, well, we'll do something better than that. And uh, not, not many of them have been very successful. This is the one in uh, Singapore, which is bigger, 165 metres. Um, this is the one in Las Vegas. The one on the left is the one that was built. I started work on the one on the right, but that was abandoned. I've, worked, I've made a good living out of not building wheels, if you know what I mean. There's well, a number of them have been abandoned. Here's another one I worked on, and that was uh, 208 metres high. That got as far as the fabrication stage before it was uh, abandoned, unfortunately. There's an interesting uh, hazard there, which most people won't spot. Anybody Chinese in the audience? No? 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 OK. Well, there's 48 capsules, because, as usual, things were getting a bit sticky on the money. And uh, you have to have 48 or 12 or 24, you see. So it was decided to top to 24. But the word for 24 in Chinese or sure, sounds like death. So there's no way you can have 24 capsules. Of course, nobody had spotted this in the design team, and that was a sort of bit of a problem. And this is the one that was uh, is still not finished in Dubai, which is 210 metres high. Now, I put a question mark about the value of height there. There's not, if you think about it, Commercially, there's no point in building wheels this big. It's not sensible. However, some people want it for prestige reasons, and uh, they will try. And this one, eventually, I think, will be opened. And you can see that. That was taken some time ago when the legs were just up. I think the rim's in, in place now. It's a really successful project, which is fully sustainable. Uh, it doesn't cost anything to run. And recyclable is this one, you see. And that's the way to do it if you went into uh, to recycling. This is the London Eye, and I put this up to show a point that I made right at the beginning of the lecture of the interaction between different systems. Because all these rides have the same thing. There's always a drive system, there's always electrical, there's always a control system, and there's always a structure and bearings and interface between bearings and the structure and things like that, which require certain tolerance issues and things of that nature. And this is the capsules on the London Eye. It gets a frame, it's got motion, it's got bearings, it's got a control system. And there are, the technically biggest problem on here is not the structure of the motor, it's the air conditioning. Because you're in a goldfish bowl and uh, on a very hot day, it's, it, it's the safety issue is the protection of people of a failure in hot weather. 
So I say that to bring out this point about the difficulty of the interaction of several different disciplines, air conditioning, which is not just nice to have, it is a fundamental part of the safety case that the air conditioning will function and the design team have to think along those lines. Another technical issue comes with cables. Uh, cables are not a very common technology, apart from bridge designers. And on a wheel like this, the cables sag. And they rotate, in, as the wheel rotates, they sag the opposite direction. So again, the cable design is based on fatigue. Because the end is cycling backwards and forwards, and the tension is varying all the time. And the amount of sag is probably proportional to diameter squared. So if you look at the sag on the left, which is the London eye, and you look at the sag on the Singapore flyer, it's different because the diameters are different and the scale of the job produces a design problem on its own because the sag gets bigger, the fatigue gets bigger, the life gets shorter. And there are various techniques for improving the life. If you go and look at the London eye, you'll see some of them. But again, it's not an area of technology most of us are familiar with. Neither is cable vibration, which was an issue on big suspension bridge with vortex shedding. There are, there are various things that can happen to cables to make them shed and vibrate. And if they vibrate, the number of cycles is very, very high, and therefore the fatigue life will be damaged, so you don't want that to happen. So the solution is to damp them. So again, it's an area of technology not cropping up in most of structural engineering. But if you go down to the river and have a look, you'll see the dampers on the, uh, on the wheel. And uh, this is the hub and spindle being made, uh, which is a big piece of steel. Of those who are too young to have seen it, this is the erection. So was, we were very pushed on program, and the challenge was to build it in a day. It wasn't actually a day, but it was the day to lift it up. So uh, you can see it going down if you want, but... Uh, it was a spectacular day, and it all seemed to work quite well at the end. And the mechanical electrical systems, there's a big bearing in the middle, and as far as the structural engineers, that means controlling the distortion of the structure so that the bearing functions because that's got some articulation in it, but obviously there's an interaction between the two disciplines that you have to be aware of. And the drive system was on the rim. There's an interaction with that because you have to have a bit on the... Our structure has the bit that the wheels can clamp onto and the wheels turn and push the whole thing round. And uh, there's some articulation involved in that. So there's this interface with the drive system. And you have to have electrical power for lights, air conditioning, whatever, whatever. And that also has to interface with the rim. And that's this close interaction between several disciplines. One of the technologies you might be least familiar with is control system. And that's a problem because it means that there's always a chance that you will not ask the appropriate question to understand what drives the safety of the ride to demand that the control system engineers fulfill that function. Somebody's got to understand what is required. And a common fault with control systems is that the user requirement demands, specification, are not specified because the person doing the structure doesn't really understand what's required. So there's a number of complications in control systems. They normally have sensors. There's a sensor to tell you what speed is going. And that feeds back to a computer, which makes a various decisions and things like that. And there's the control panel from the London Eye, which says which systems are working, which are not working, whether the fire conditions are working, whether the wheel's going round this way, clockwise or anti-clockwise. Because depending on which way it's going round, the capsule has to know which way it's going round and has to be level and things like that. And the, the computer system can make certain decisions. So when I referred to the importance of the air conditioning before, one of the things this computer does is check the air conditioning is working and the temperature is right before it allows anyone to enter the capsule. And if, logical if, it is not working and not right, the door doesn't open. So there are demands made on the structure and things like that. And a control panel might look something like this, on, off, an emergency stop. And as far as the structure is concerned, this is another feature down in London Eye. 
where it tells you which capsules are working, which ones are operating, what the numbers are, where they are in space and things of that nature. And you can monitor the structure as well. And any system will have some emergency stops on it. Just as any escalator you go on the underground has an emergency stop if there's a crisis. But what we want for the structure, what we want is this keyword reliability. That's a very difficult concept. Because when the dinosaur bob heads bobs down, it only obviously stops short of you. And when we say it stops short, it has to stop. Not if, not but. Not if the sensor's not working. Not if the electricity's failed. It has to stop. That concept of reliability exists. When you go in the crocodile pool, or when Jane goes in the crocodile pool, we have to be sure they can get out again. Okay? You can't say the mitigation measure is to swim for it, even if you've got a swimming costume on, because that's not the brightest of ideas. So this concept of can you be absolutely sure? Now, you might think this is specialised to here, but it's portable technology for the nuclear industry, for the rail industry, for any transport system. When you stop, I just come on the underground this today, if you go through, I came through Moorgate, and many of the older members will remember the Moorgate crash when the train did not stop for various reasons and killed a lot of people. So the technology and the way of thinking about what might go wrong and how you guarantee it what went wrong should be known by every engineer. And that's the way you have to learn to think. And there are ways of doing it. So safety is a critical issue. Someone like me has to stand up and say, this ride as a whole, this system as a whole, is safe. That's a very difficult challenge. And one we're going to be increasingly asked to front up. So here is a fault on the Singapore flyer. What happened is the wheel stopped. And it couldn't be started again. And because it couldn't be started again, people had to be rescued from height, which is not easy. And the design fault was that the elect what, what you do on a, the, the brakes on these are back to front to a car. So on a car, when you put the brake on, it stops. On a wheel, on a secure mechanical system, the brakes are always on, unless there is power to get them off. Okay? Now here, the total power for running the wheel and running the brakes the lifting system went through what was supposedly a, re a, re a reliable switch. And that switch failed. So then they lost power to turn the wheel and they lost power to lift the drive wheels off the rim in order to rotate it with an emergency system. And that's caused consternation throughout the world. And that's either what a common cause failure in jargon of or a single point failure. What you do not want is one single failure on a system that can deny you what your fundamental safety argument is. And the fundamental safety argument for anything like this, a railway is under all circumstances you can get people off if you have to. You can always turn it. Now if you look at the news instance, this March last year, this, this ship failed and it supposedly it had four engines for redundancy. So when you're crossing the Atlantic on a Boeing, you don't cross on one engine, you want two or, two, or, two or four engines, and you hope that if two fail, the other two will work. So you do not have a system where anything can fail all four together. That was a common cause failure. And you don't want one system which can knock out two of your safety systems together. That is a concept design fault. Now it appears from the news that the common lubrication system failed and they lost all four engines. Either that or the ship was rocking so much in the storm it knocked it out. But that's exactly the time when you need the four engines. So this way of thinking by Hazups, Hazard and Operational Analysis is something that ought to be taught to every engineer so you think about the system as a whole. And here on the London Eye we have the possibility, and there's a parallel with structural engineering, of a single point failure. The rim, 800 passengers, the whole project, the whole concept depends on one cantilever. 
So we want to be absolutely certain that cantilever is adequate. Now, you can read the technical articles in the journal about why it is adequate. But the starting point is for the designers not just to do numbers and pick a coast safety facts out of the book and say, you know, you look at it and you say, what can go wrong? What are the consequences if it goes wrong? And the answer is we lose the entire project. And you make sure you do something about it. And it's that thought process which is often overlooked. If we just look forward, I made these comments about sensors and reliability. And you've also seen in the news the Boeing 737. Now, the consequence of that failure was that number of deaths, the whole fleet grounded worldwide, and lots of orders. Now, I only have the press reports to go on. So the press reports say there were two sensors in the nose which were read by the control system, the computer, and one of the sensors was giving duff information. I, I can't really believe this. I mean, I don't want to believe it because then any roller coaster we work at, first of all, you do a hazard and risk assessment and you say, if this fails, what happens? And if, if what happens is intolerable, not failure, you move towards the safety integrity level, which is the top level, as you would in a nuclear industry or something like this. And it is possible to configure a control system so there is almost an incredibility of failure. I mean, you might have three sensors and a voting system. But the principle is that if you have one, it will fail, not it can fail. It will fail off, on, just as the light switch can fail. Off, on, or unreliable. We all know an intermittent fault is the most difficult one. And sometimes when we want absolute reliability, we have redundancy and diversity, which is redundancy to give multiple systems, and we take the best two out of three or three out of four, or we have a completely different system in parallel so that the probability of both of them failing is reduced to almost zero. And those concepts of safety are very important, but it, I, I just can't believe that that. The other concept that comes here is that the, the, the pilots apparently couldn't overcome the, the computer system and were totally reliant on the software. Each of you in this room, young people, will be totally reliant on your structural analysis software. And a lot of you will not understand the input or the output. So the old people are constantly giving warnings about this. The move in our industry to reliance on computer systems that we don't really understand that we, and that is not a safe thing to do. There's always got to be validation and verification of any analysis we do to see it's about right because there are dangers in total reliability. Well, it's, it's a standard conflict in aircraft. You know, do you believe the computer or do you believe your instincts? But there are parallels in our own industry. And then there are a number of generic problems. I mean, things do go wrong. Fatigue failures occur. This is a fatigue failure where it caused something that went off. And it, if you have a fatigue failure, which is a single point failure, you should not design that way. This is anything that's moving, the railway track, you keep people off it because if they wander on, they're likely to get killed. A fundamental concept in any tram system, any railway system, any aircraft system is passenger containment. You're in something and you're safe within it, you can't fall out. So the fundamental concept on here is if you're inside the capsule, you're safe. And that gives you a set of hazards to look at, like fire, air conditioning, things like that. The parallel with that is that if you're really, really secure inside and if something goes wrong, you have to be able to get people out. So on any roller coaster, there will be a means of escape at the sides so that if the worst happens, you have to be able to say... I can evacuate the passengers. And the containment level within that really depends on the severity of the ride. There are, there are rules about it, but there will be seating systems of various sorts. And uh, these types of seats with those headrests are designed for the fact that people are rotating this way. You don't want the head to shake about and you want them contained against the worst forces that are likely to occur on the system. So the design of the seats is linked back to the forces and the motion that you predict. And these seats are very sophisticated, obviously. 
And underneath, there is an override system, so you can always get people out if you have to. People stand up, they jump up. You really don't want them to do that because they might get the head chopped off. So on any ride, a check is made of the envelope where people stick in them that they cannot physically touch anything. And that's part of the overall safety attribute. And we have various computer models of shapes of people that check that various things. On any mechanical system, the principle will be it might fail. So there's normally always a backup chain. So if the worst happens and a bit falls off, it won't fall off. It'll be anchored on. And if you look at some of the cross reports, the dangers of bits falling off buildings because of work loose or something like that is significant. One of the worst accidents occurred in the 1950s at Battersea Fun Fair, and this started off the, the British legislation. The, track, the coaster went up the track. It failed and came back down the track slightly and killed five children. And as a consequence of that, there's now a chain going up with an anti-rollback device. And that's that clackety-clack you can hear. It's a Paul and Cog system. And the principle is that if you go up and the chain fails, the car will be caught on the way back. Again, it's the concept of thinking what might go wrong and thinking the worst and designing against it. So here's the anti-rollback system on another ride. And there's a chain dog goes in like that, that catches on things. And then, of course, you will normally test it with a dummy, send it round, and at some stage you have to have a volunteer, which is why we need Jane here for the crocodile pool uh, when it's coming up. Anyway, I've probably said enough on that, but that's a sort of very advanced coast, the way you go round and round and up and down at the same time. But I hope that gives you a, an overall impression of the fascinating world that, uh, that roller coasters demand. But I don't want you to think it's entirely specialised in something you will never be involved in. What I would like you to take away, particularly in the safety aspects, is that these are portable skills. And the way of thinking about safety is something that we could all develop a bit better. It's crucial to the nuclear industry. It will be crucial to a lot of the things we do on the rail industry. And there is danger at the interfaces between different disciplines of overlooking something really serious. Thank you very much.